Hi, Maria. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I am wonderful. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let me introduce us. I'm Rob Wright. This is The Wright Show on Meaning of Life TV. You are Maria Popova. You are the creator and prop proprietor of the well-known site uh, brainpickings.org. And, you know, if I had to describe this site, I might say that if there's one site other than Meaning of Life TV whose focus is the meaning of life, uh, that would be your site. Is that one fair way to describe it? It's, it's about the meaning of life? That's very, it's a very generous way to describe it. It's about the, the meaning of a particular life, perhaps, through many past lives. But it is essentially a record of what is meaningful to me as a subjective individual human person at a point in time. Okay. Uh, now, when somebody asks you at a party or something, if you run into somebody who hasn't heard of the site, and I would think that would be a declining portion of the population, but I'm sure there are some. Um, Parents among them. <laughs> is, is that true? No, no, they, they, they know my site, but the conversation of what do you do uh, is a, a perennial dinner table. They're still trying to figure out what the point of your existence is? Yes. Well... <laughs> It's a job somebody's got to do, I guess. Well, what do you what do you tell them or anybody if if you know other than to say it's about the the meaning of life? If the, if you have two or three sentences to describe what you're up to on this site, what do you say? Depending on how serious or not, I'm feeling. Uh, I would say something like, um, you know, I, I write about dead people's forgotten books and. Um, <laughs> try to extract from them some semblance of understanding of what it means to live a meaningful, substantive, fulfilling life. Right. And it's um, these dead people, I would say, uh, they tend toward the, well, philosophical in one sense or another, but they tend to be, I would say, philosophers, writers, poets. Is that, 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 that accounts, artists? I, I don't think... Um, disciplinary boundaries have ever really mattered much to me, which is why I write about such diverse fields. Um, and I, I should also say that I'm, at this point, what's considered an internet ancient, that my site is in its 10th year, um, which means it has evolved enormously. I began it when I was in my early 20s, and so it has evolved as much as I have. And so the focus has shifted. Yes, right now, I would say probably a significant portion would be classified as those fields that you mentioned and do have a, a philosophical dimension, but uh, it's never a selection criterion per se. It's more of a byproduct. Okay. And just for, for people who haven't seen the site, typically you will write a short essay uh, that addresses some question often about how to live your life or how to think about life. Um, in which you will you will quote uh, you'll usually focus on a particular thinker. You may allude to more than one thinkers, um, but but you'll highlight uh, something that they have 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 said uh, that's interesting, that's important. Um, you don't generally chase the news. Now, recently, when David Bowie died, I, I noticed that you you put up uh, yeah, you 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 found some somewhere where he had listed his. Uh, some of his favorite books. Well, that's actually from my archive. It's a piece that I did a number of years ago about um, the Proust questionnaire. Oh, no, the, the his favorite books. Yes, that's also from the archive. And when something happens, I would say, I guess, in the news, I mean, you know, you, in, in your conversation with Andrew Sullivan, who I love, you know, Andrew and I talk a lot about this notion of cultural stewardship. What, it, what does it mean? And I think a lot of what I do deals with preserving the legacy and the, the ideas of people who have, you know, died and who are no longer newsworthy, but are very worthwhile in their thinking and their person. And so when something happens in the news, somebody's death, somebody, you know, today, you know, Martin Luther King Day, I would pull something up from the archive that kind of reminds us that, hey, this person existed and mattered and, and here's something substantive that they did that is as relevant today as it was when it was done. And what did you do for Martin Luther King Day? Um, I mean, on your site. I don't, I, I very rarely write things for the day. Right. 
because that's an endless calendar chasing news job and I'm kind of a one woman anti newsroom, but I did resurface on the social channels, um, his letter from a Birmingham jail mm -hmm. and, um, this piece that he wrote called an experiment on love, which actually, um, you know, he was very inspired by Gandhi and by ancient Greek philosophy. And so he dealt with the uh, Greek notion of agape and how it can help us learn to love those different from us. And I mean, it's almost beside the point to point out how enormously timely that is given what's happening in our culture today with our intolerance for difference. Hmm. Um, that's interesting. The, uh, so you said you um, you are an internet uh, a veteran. I mean, as you know, as, as people on the internet go, your site has been around a while. What you'll you'll have your tenth anniversary in in two thousand sixteen. Is that right? Or, I, yes, yeah. in October. And um, and you have certainly adapted. I mean, when you started the site, Twitter didn't exist. Now you have a huge Twitter following. You know, I I uh, looked up this. Um, a uh, piece that Bruce Feiler wrote about you for the New York Times a few years ago, and I think that was in like 2012, and it said you had 260,000 Twitter followers or something, and I looked, and now you have like close to 700,000 Twitter followers. So you're, the site continues to grow. You're adapting uh, to the internet in in proficient manner, but, it, but there is something about the site that runs counter to some kind of internet tendencies, right? A lot of it, the, the very premise of writing about things that are anti-newsworthy to begin with. But I also, you know, I've always, I mean, I started the site because I wanted a record of the things that I cared about, that I wanted, things that I wanted to exist, writing I wanted to read, and I did read. And I've always had this philosophy of just make the things you want to exist in the world. And so, for example, I am very aggrieved by listicles and clickbaity titles and things that I just don't think should exist that are not in the service of, of humanity. And so those are Internet kind of tropes that I have deliberately avoided because they just annoy me and I would never perpetrate them on my in my own home, you know. <laughs> But you've managed to get people to click. <laughs> well, whether or not they do is up to them. I don't deliberately go out of my way to get them to. <laughs> so how did it start? It started with you emailing little things you found inspirational to friends or colleagues. Is that how, how exactly? Yeah, I, I was in college when I started it. And I had come to the U.S. for college from Bulgaria, which is where I grew up. And I kind of wasn't, it wasn't what I expected. It wasn't. I mean, I, I thought the liberal arts education model, the whole Ivy League cell, was that they were going to teach me how to live and how to live meaningfully. And uh, instead, and maybe this was just my poor choices because I went to a very large school, but I ended up in all of these lecture halls of 400 students and some professor in the front reading from a PowerPoint slide, not knowing anybody's name, having no discourse. They, and then sort of standardized testing you on how well you remembered the PowerPoint slides. And to me, that was not at all what I wanted. And so I ended up spending a lot of time at the library and just poking around and trying to really, I mean, it was fumbling in the dark to find things that gave me a sense of meaning. And I kept a record of that, which is what became brain pickings. Mm -hmm. Now, meanwhile, I was working for job. I mean, I came from I guess what you could say is the 99% of Bulgaria into a school that was the 1% of America. And so I worked four jobs to pay for, for, for the school that wasn't all that satisfying. This was Penn? This was Penn? Yeah, I went to Penn. And, and, um, and again, I mean, I think Penn is a great school, but I had no guidance, no idea. I took all these massive classes. The only rewarding things were the small seminars, which if I could do it over, I would only have taken those, you know. But in any case, I had the experience I had, and one of the four jobs that I worked to pay for it, for it was um, at a little agency in downtown Philly that was kind of in the creative, creative industry. And uh, there were such smart, young, idealistic guys. It was seven guys and me. And yet they were circulating, you know, those kind of forward emails around the office for inspiration just from within their own field. And I thought, okay, well, 
my intuitive sense is that creativity doesn't work this way. It, it works by taking all these disparate elements from different fields and combining them in new ways. And then you can think about original thought and creation and all that. And so I started sending this kind of these dual unsettlement, my educational one and the one in, uh, at work made me start sending them every Friday three things that I'd learned about through my kind of own library time and whatnot that had nothing to do with the the field, but was just interesting and meaningful and inspiring and sometimes just fun. So that's how it was born. And, the, and I should say, not only was there no Twitter then, there was no WordPress or WordPress maybe had just launched, but it was not, nobody, I, I my brain pickings was originally a static HTML site that I would literally hard code every Friday. So I also took a night class to learn how to do that because I didn't know how to do that. I would hard code it and then I would remove physically. It's almost like a bulletin on like the Whole Foods, you know, mm -hmm. checkout. Remove the old issue and like, put up the new one. It was like a manual blog. So it'd be a new page every time that would replace the old page. Yeah, there was no archive, there was no CMS, there was nothing like that. Eventually, I migrated it to WordPress in 2007. Uh, yeah. And were you getting positive feedback all along, or did you have to persist for a while in obscurity on the web? On the web, I mean, you know, the reason I put it on the web in the first place, because it started as that office-wide email, is that I thought people, other people besides myself, I mean, it was always very nourishing to me. That was the whole point. It was a record of what I found nourishing. But my colleagues were forwarding it to friends of theirs and like, check this out, you know, and I thought, okay, well, other people are getting similar nourishment out of this really kind of subjective thing. Why not put it on the internet? And I had no idea. I mean, there was, again, there was no social media then. It was just more so that I wouldn't have to send it myself to many people. It would just exist somewhere and people could visit it if they wanted to. Um, and I didn't, I mean, the first few years, I didn't have any sense of who was reading it. The original WordPress, I remember, it had a little stats graph. When you log in, it would like show you. And one day, it had 100 people who had read it. And at that point, I remember thinking, OK, I know seven people in my real life who read it. And maybe each of them sent it to two friends, but a hundred people, that's crazy, because now it's strangers reading it. Mm -hmm. like it's strangers, this notion of people you don't know, who you're likely never going to meet, are reading something that you wrote. It's really strange at first. And now, of course, we take it for granted, because that's what the Internet is. Yeah, and I imagine a, a couple of decimal points have been added to that, number of daily, uh, number yeah. of daily readers, at least. Um, and, and so from the beginning, it was kind of just an expression of things that you found interesting and meaningful with not that much calculation about what other people would find interesting. Yeah, and, and I mean, and also it was a, what a 20-something, early 20-something thought was interesting and meaningful. So it was not, you know, Kierkegaard and Susan Sontag. <laughs> okay, well then, so what was it in the beginning? Because it is that now well, among other people. I mean, a lot of it was more technology-based. I mean, I was really interested in how technology was kind of shaping. Hmm. And I went to school for kind of media and, and how the media are impacting the way we think about culture and commerce and everything. Um, so, and, and you know, this was the, what, 2005 through 2008 was the boom when, you know, online video was just starting to happen. Mm -hmm. There was no TED.com. There was no, you know, all of these things that I just thought were really interesting. And so I guess I would give more kind of techie things. Um, I was also very interested in neuroscience, and I would, you know, read obscure academic journals and send little abstracts from that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. But, but the title was there from the beginning, Brain Pickings. Yeah, which I don't love at all. I mean, the, it, well, it's, why not? I mean, I had always assumed it's a reference to, you know, people say I'm going to pick your brain. Well, I, I, I mean, the most tragic thing about it is that I actually have come to really loathe puns. I really loathe things that are named after puns. Or I mean, it's just so cheap. And, uh, you know, I was a foreigner who had just come here, and I thought it was a good phrase. I thought, and again, because I was doing a lot of... Um, cognitive science and neuroscience 
was a big part of what I was writing about, I thought, okay, well, you know, that's what I'm going to call it. But I didn't give it that much thought. I didn't, you know, and now it's kind of like your name, you know, you're stuck with it. Whether or not you love it, you've stopped evaluating it because it's just so elemental to your identity that you just don't go around thinking, well, I hate the name Maria. I hate the name Maria. I hate the name Maria. (laughs) Yeah. I think it would be easier to completely transform the content of the site and turn it into something completely different than to change the brand and survive that transition. It's hard to, it's hard to survive a brand transition. Yes and no. I mean, one of my favorites, they're not just a site, but their online presence has renamed multiple times. Uh, Krista Tippett's currently on being, and it was before was speaking of faith, faith, but there was another one before that. And they've gone through, you know, she's been doing this for what, 15 years. And yeah, but also I can't, I also, I mean, while I agree that on being is by far better than any of the previous iterations, I don't particularly care what it's called once I'm drawn into the substance of what, it does, you know, so I don't even know right. if a name change is even worth yeah. dealing with. Yeah, I think that was actually semantically significant. I mean, it's, it's, it, I think maybe part of the idea was to make clear it wasn't just a show about religion. Right. But it, it, it too is a show about the meaning of life, you might say. And in fact, is maybe the closest thing to a radio equivalent of your site, even though, of course, she can't interview dead people, so she can't. <laughs> There's not that parallel. But she brings things really well in. I mean, there was a show on, um, you know, they did this project called the Civil Conversations Project, which was about what a civil rights look like in today's world. And, you know, they were able to find these amazing recordings of W.B. W. B. Du Bois mm-hmm. and like all these thinkers speaking at different places. That They had a recording of Einstein uh, reading one of his lectures. So it's possible, and, I, and radio is even more intimate, so the person really comes alive in a different way. Mm-hmm. You know? So I assume, given what you've said, that we can uh, infer a fair amount of your own philosophy from what we see on the site. I wouldn't go as far as calling anything <laughs> that I subscribe to or that I believe to be true a philosophy. I think that's a little pompous for an individual person just trying to live their life <laughs> you know, to, to call the, their way of living. But uh, you could infer what's important to me, yes. Okay. So, for example, can I, can I just throw a couple of things that have been on the site recently? In particular, you, you made, a, 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 I would say, a rare exception to your general aversion to listicles on New Year's when you listed some, some resolutions uh, that, that you thought would be productive. And they weren't, they weren't your typical resolutions like drink less wine every day or something. It was a, a little, little deeper than that. But the first one was from Adrian Rich, Cultivate Honorable Relationships that I assume has, what does that mean to you? And I mean, first of all, I should say these resolutions are really values, values that are perennial, that are worth remembering at the start of a new year, because I did very much, uh, I was deliberate in kind of the wink at the resolution trope, and also the sense of failure that it carries for most people, that people resolve to do things and mm-hmm. <laughs> mostly don't but I do think there's some something interesting about the rhythm of life where you get to this point where you have to remember what's important to you and you know sometimes it is drink less wine and those are practical things but I think the deeper things are really what inform the the specific practical behaviors ultimately and the Audrey and Rich one about human relationships you know she she first of all is one of the most extraordinary minds and writers and poets of the past century and is so gravely underappreciated today that it just breaks my heart. And I think a lot of the people that I'm interested in have this in common, that are, they're not, you know, Mark Twain or Oscar Wilde and these kind of early pop culture celebrities, mm-hmm. although they too have substantive ideas that I've written about. But... Um, she was very political and, and, and very kind of morally righteous while being the opposite of self-righteous. Um, and in this beautiful piece that she wrote in the 70s, she talked about the value of truthful, 
honorable, honest human relationships? And who are the people that you bring along with you through life that, that are willing to go the long and difficult way? And how do you cultivate those relationships and not the ones that are transactional or that are, that, that are based on things other than the deepest, most sincere values? And I think in our you know, age of, you know, even, if, even using the word social networks, and the notion of networking, it's so transactional. It's mm -hmm. holiday parties or networking. And it, there's something about really continually revisiting who the people are, who nourish you, who don't drain you or don't give you a tit for tat sense of, you know, I'm going to do this for them and they're going to do this for me. And just what, what is that? What is that like in the world today? How do we cultivate those relationships or even begin to think or to remember that that's actually what counts, you know? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I mean, evolutionary psychologists would say that friendship, the biological infrastructure of friendship, that is the, the emotions that sustain it, like trust, a sense of obligation, you know, I mean, friendship is, is, is seen from a Darwinian standpoint as something that, that kind of biologically evolved. And, and the idea would be that in a certain sense, it was transactional in the underlying logic. In other words, we naturally tend to be friends with people who do things for us and we do things for them and, and, and it works out for both. But, but, but you're right that, that if it becomes explicitly transactional, that kind of undermines the feelings that sustain the institution and you may be right that, uh, that that there's something about modern technology and the kind of networking ethos that accompanies it that that almost uh, is a, you know tends to undermine the spirit of friendship. Mm. Um, and you know you write about that or you touch on that in Non Zero, which a, a lot of that I I think is even more relevant today than whenever 15 years ago, whenever it came out 16 years ago, you know? Um, so yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, let's take another, uh, another, well, first of all, I want to say it's interesting what you said that, that one thing you do is, you know, kind of resurrect or give people who have been half forgotten or, or if not, if you don't want to put it that grandiosely, maybe, you know, help, help, help give a little attention to people who you think are getting less than they, deserve because when I look at your site I, I I kind of think two things I mean on the one hand I think uh, you know there was this uh, book uh, probably before your time called cultural literacy huge bestseller by a guy by ed Hirsch and it was kind of the things you should know to consider yourself culturally literate and uh, but this is like I don't know 25 years ago or something on the one hand, I look at your site and I think, yeah, this this would be a great site to go to to sustain cultural literacy, especially in the realms of kind of philosophy, literature, art. Um, on the other hand, I do see a number of names where I kind of recognize the name, but then I think, oh, I should know more. I should be able to say who exactly this person is, but I can't. I mean, you're right. On the one hand, you have the Bertrand Russells and the Sartres and, and Susan Sontag and everything. But I couldn't have, if you had said Adrian Rich, honestly, I could not have, you know, told you. And and there's a lot of, it seems like, it, you know, at least kind of half of the people you highlight are for me in that kind of twilight zone where, okay, I, I, I've, I've heard the name, but I don't, but I don't know exactly why. Mm. Well, you know, what's interesting is that I think that is a function of my being a complete outsider to American and English speaking culture that I came here with this enormous sense of cultural debt, and I assumed that everybody knew who these people were. I assumed it was part of the fabric of American culture, and uh, up to a certain point, that was true. There was a lot of these people that were kind of in the common record for the average person you know, were completely foreign to me. Carl Sagan and Maurice Sendak, and you know, I discovered Maurice Sendak's so-called children's books, which I think are worse of philosophy, really, as an adult. and. Past that point, at some point, I tipped over into that twilight zone where I continued to assume that everybody knows who these people are, but they didn't, and which has kind of serious and funny consequences, especially coming at it as a reader of, you know, I would not even know how to pronounce people's names because I've only seen them in print. And I actually only recently learned from a scholar, this was last month, that the name is pronounced 
Adrian Rich, not Adrian Rich. Oh, really? So I'm I, getting it wrong? Yeah. I was thinking, you know, normally a name spelled that way would be Adrian. So when you said Adrian, I thought, oh, you know, these Bulgarians, you know, <laughs> they don't really get <laughs> English pronunciation. But, but that's what happens, that if you're familiar with the person, and it's funny because I uh, recently, I don't watch very many movies, but of course, when the documentary about Susan Sontag came out, I had to watch it. And she recounts this... Um, anecdote where she she went to France and she went to some library and uh, she didn't know how to pronounce Proust. She thought it was Proust. I, I like, pronounced I it that way in college. I, I, I embarrassed myself Everybody, I feel like that is everybody. Everybody thinks that. And it's, it's funny, but it's also poignant because it reminds you how much uh, the inside and the outside. It's always this permeable membrane. You know, there's this constant osmosis of what you know, what you don't know, what you assume everybody else knows, and how also literature is its own captive space you know yeah i i thought i was unusual during college and having imposter syndrome and thinking like i didn't deserve to be there and these other brilliant people did but now i now realize most people at most colleges have imposter syndrome yeah um so okay so one of the one of the more prominent names you featured on this list of uh, resolutions was Bertrand Russell. Make room for fruitful monotony. Mm. Is that like what does he mean by that? And is that a big thing for you? I uh, I think we live in a culture that has completely lost the capacity for boredom to a point where we are terrified of it. We are terrified of being alone in our own company with our own thoughts. Um, and in a sense, boredom is about tolerating uncertainty, the uncertainty of the moment that is unfilled. And he wrote, and this was in 1930, he wrote about this notion of fruitful monotony being essential to having a fulfilling life, to being a well-rounded person. You know, and I think now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at, you know, some, say, at Whole Foods at the checkout aisle, and I literally, there are two people in front of me, the line's going to... And I'm going to, my turn is going to come in maybe 40 seconds. What do I do? I take my iPhone out. Not because I have anything urgent to do, but because I just, this is what we do. And I think we're losing something. We're, we're losing something important. And uh, when he talks about fruitful monotony, it's about creating moments where, that are unoccupied by deliberate plans but are fruitful in the sense that this unburdened space gives you time and, and, and room for reflection, which is how you really make sense of anything. And I think without making room for reflection, we get into this Rube Goldberg machine of reactivity. Because right now, I think most people, you know, myself included, we're in this business of reacting to whatever's thrown our way, the to-do list, the somebody's opinion, some, this and that, and without reflection to mediate that, we can't respond, we just react, and it just really is an alarming hamster wheel of false urgency, you know? Yeah, it's funny, you mentioned Andrew Sullivan, he and I were at the New Republic together pre-internet, and I remember the rule of thumb, it was a weekly magazine, so, so, so when you be looking at something that happened and asking yourself, is it recent enough to write about? The rule of thumb was if I could say it happened last week, I could write about it. Now I would say it's like, <laughs> if you can say it happened last hour, you can write about it. But in terms of actually capturing attention on the internet, if it's yesterday, you better have something really, really interesting and captivating to say or else nobody's gonna pay any attention. Yes, and I, I, I mean you're obviously an exception. You're, 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 you know, you're defying that trend, but but that's where most most of the internet is. Yes and no. I, I think that is where the compulsive consumption of media happens. But at the end of the day, when people sit down and sit back and decide what they want to engage with, I would say at this point, most intelligent people reach for something. Uh, slower, reach for, you know, longform.org or on being, or this is when we are not in the momentum of it. When we actually pause and reflect what we need, we do that, mm -hmm. which is why, you know, it's funny that we even use the term long form. I mean, this used to be called journalism, you know, <laughs> but, but, but there's a rise in the long form movement that people crave that. And I, that gives me hope. I will say that I, I think 
every technology is ultimately a technology of thought, meaning its physical structure, its practical delivery shapes how we think. The internet is very much a technology that's predicated on reverse chronology. So when you look at Twitter, when you look at Facebook, timelines, they're always in reverse chronology. News, you know, Google News, all of these things, and they give you the false sense that what is at the top, that, there, that there's a hierarchy of importance, not just a temporal hierarchy, meaning what is most recent is somehow most relevant and most important, and what is buried down below loses relevance as you go along, but that's not really the case. <coughs> yeah. I mean, so back to this list of uh, 16 uh, New Year's resolutions. Uh, one name on that is Ann Truitt. That's another name that for me is only half familiar. But uh, hers is choose understanding over judgment. What does that mean? So Ann Truitt, um, for those unfamiliar, uh, of whom I was one until recently, uh, was an artist, but before she became an artist, she was trained as a um, psychiatrist. So she wrote a diary that, because she had such uncommon insight into into psychology and into kind of the human spirit, and also an artist's observational powers, her diary ended up being one of the most profound, you know, on par with Susan Sontag's diary, which to me is the gold standard. Um, and so. In one passage, in some random entry, she recounts an anecdote from her childhood where she um, sees this very fat man at the deli and immediately has these judgments about who he is and his character and, you know, and then she catches herself as a child and she kind of backtracks and really does, as now, as an adult looking back on the incident, does this meditation of what do we gain and what do we lose when we make these judgments and isn't it our, our task really to understand each other as opposed to create these artificial shells of who we think the person is that serve neither us nor them um, and it's a beautiful it's a beautiful little passage that um, she just and, and and that's why I don't like relaying what people what these people say I prefer using their original words uh, because that is where the beauty is and that where the truth of their experience is. And mm -hmm. I think to honor it properly, you have to read it in the original and not summarize it and kind of retell it. Mm -hmm. And the idea partly is, I gather, not just that your time is better spent understanding than judging, but judgment can actually impede understanding. And impedes love. That's her point, which, you know, to, to go back to Dr. King and his essay, timely on this day of our conversation um, makes the same point. And, and, and that's part of, you know, a lot of what I do ends up circling back to these baseline themes that are recurring across different periods of time and thinkers and schools of thought and regions of the world. And, and there's something powerful about that because when you see that somebody in the Far East, you know, 600 years ago had the same thought as somebody in California in the 1970s, it becomes easier to internalize that this is some kind of significant abiding human truth that might as well internalize it now. Mm -hmm. Maybe now more than ever. I mean, you, you, you alluded earlier to the fact that we are living in a time when, I don't know how you put it, but there's more kind of conflict between groups or more uh, I mean, I, I gather you're referring to a kind of a, a, a tribalism e either in the United States or more broadly. Does this not ring a bell? What are you referring to? At the very beginning of the conversation, you said something about something that was uh, particularly apt now that we're living in a period when... Oh, about difference and the intolerance. Exactly, yeah. Intolerance of difference is what you said. Okay, what, what did I, you have in mind? Well, I mean... A lot of it is in the news, in the actual news, all the shootings and all the uh, racial injustice and aggression and these kind of hate crimes that are based on, I mean, based on essentially laziness, because stereotypes are a form of laziness. They're a way of uh, coming up with an idea of who a person is, what a community is, based on a preconceived notion instead of based on understanding, and out of this laziness comes aggression. Um, 
and to read, you know, around the time of Ferguson, so about a year and a half ago now, a year and a few months ago, I, by complete chance, came upon a conversation that Margaret Mead and James Baldwin had in 1970, the transcript of which was published as A Rap on Race. And I, it's, the book, unfortunately, is very out of print, which is a whole other question of why these enormously timely, beautiful things go out of print. Um, but I, I found it, I read it, I read it probably more closely than any other book I'd spent time with up to that point, and was astonished uh, at what a record it was, both of how far we've come mm -hmm. and how far we have yet to go, how much what they're saying is not only pertinent to what's going on today, but is also much wiser than the commentary about what's going on today, today. And in part because the conversation that they had took place over the course of seven hours spread across two and a half days. In real life, they sat down on a stage in three sessions and conversed. They conversed. They didn't react, respond, you know, they converse, and we don't do that. And to, to, to see how, you know, how relevant it is and how heartbreakingly relevant it is, it was astonishing to me. Mm -hmm. Was this the one where Baldwin said something like, you can't let the world tell you how you'll be treated or something yeah. along those lines? So right? He said, you have to tell the world how you're going to be treated. If the world tells you how you're going to be treated, that you're in trouble. And you're in trouble. Um, so uh, now, now you, you know, as I said, I read this uh, Bruce Feiler piece about you uh, from a few years ago in the New York Times. You lead a very disciplined life, it sounds like. Is that right? I mean, you know, you, you exercise, you have specific parts of the day allotted for certain tasks, specific parts of the week allotted for certain tasks. I do, although I will say that article, um, a little perhaps fetishize this notion a little bit, this, the, the routine aspect. I mean, I, yes, routine is very much a part of my life and, and central to having, structure is central to having a sense of order and being able to do what I do, which takes a lot of time. But I also value fruitful monotony. You know, I, I get on my bike and I ride for an hour and a half and you know, I, there's nothing planned for that time. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not, you know, I, I need time with my own body and my own brain and my own mental space that is not a to-do item, you know. Mm -hmm. And I also, in, especially in the last few years, perhaps since that piece, that piece was very old, so it's probably about three and a half years old at this point. But um, I have come to see how much routine can yes, empower us and make us more efficient, but can also really imprison us. Because I think efficiency kind of shrinks our, our scope of... Uh, the, the, the small. You can only make efficient things that are small. You know, you, you, it, it contracts your aspiration because you can only optimize for very tangible, concrete things. And I, I, I think mm -hmm. I've... I've, I've made an extra effort to have more spontaneity and less structure so that I can really fill out the boundaries of what it is that I'm not yet, that it has not been planned for, the new stuff, you mm -hmm. know, that otherwise you, you can only plan along things that are expected and predictable and certain, and then you just don't grow. Okay. So, um, would it have been a mistake to infer from that piece or any other publicity about you that you're, you know, driven? Is that not a word you'd apply to yourself? Driven by what? That term Well, that was going to be the next question. <laughs> I certainly don't know the answer, but I won't even ask it if the answer is no. I am restless. I don't know if that makes me driven, but I am creatively, intellectually, spiritually restless. Does, it, does this lead us to number 15 on that list? Martha Graham, embrace your divine dissatisfaction. Divine dissatisfaction. Gotta love Martha Graham. Uh, yes. And I mean, in a sense, brain picking started out of, perhaps not divine, but out of very concrete dissatisfaction with my experience of education, with my 
experience at work. And, and I've always been of the conviction that the, the only way, not even the best way, the only effective way to complain or to address the satisfaction is to do something, to make something that solves the point of complaint. Um, so I guess in that sense, I'm driven to solve the things that unsettle me uh, in my own life, you know, and then maybe to some extent in the world to the limited extent that I have in my power. Mm -hmm. And do you, so you, you sounds like you're fairly disciplined person, although it sounds like more and more you build into the structure of your life explicitly unstructured time, but still you sound like a fairly disciplined person. Do you practice, uh, and if so, do you want to talk about any what you would call spiritual disciplines or, or is discipline in general a spiritual thing? <laughs> well, first of all, I think the word spiritual has been so hijacked by new agey muddling that it's become vacant of meaning. So if you want to talk about spiritual, you should give me a formulation of what you mean by it so that we can talk about that. Yeah, I you know, this doesn't this question doesn't come up often because most people do have a working kind of conception and most people use the word they mean something by it. I've, I've actually thought about that a lot and different people mean different things. I mean, I, in, in, in wondering whether there's a, uh, a meaning of the term that doesn't invoke anything that's outside of a kind of a scientific worldview, I, I think I might say that it involves, um, recognition that the world as it is presented to us by ordinary consciousness, kind of default mode consciousness, is in some sense misleading, in some sense or another, that, that uh, and importantly, significantly misleading. I mean, even something uh, like, you know, we talked about judgment versus understanding. Even, even recognition that we are judging creatures, and we make these judgments as a kind of a time saver, but they're misleading and can be morally misleading and so on, to, to, to recognize that and then really try to act on it, to really try to do something to make yourself less judgmental, that would, I, to me, that would qualify as a spiritual discipline. Mm. I, yeah, if I had to define it, it would be something very close to that. I think, to me, it's concerned with the human spirit and, and how do you elevate, cultivate, the capacity of the human spirit for the things that we each value individually. For me, those being kindness and, and generosity and some kind of intelligent goodwill. Um, so in that sense, I guess I have a spiritual practice. It's called reading and writing. Uh, but I also meditate every morning. You do? Yeah. And, I, you know, and I have been for years, but I also think um, mindfulness is not something you kind of set time aside to do. It's something you learn to bring to everything you do. And I try and I, and I fail and I try again. And that's what we do, you know? Okay. So, but you do mindfulness meditation. Mm -hmm. All right. And how long has that been going on? Six, seven years, maybe. Okay. Impressive. Um, so does the success of your site tell you anything about people or about any hunger out there or anything that you 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 didn't know 10 years ago or well first of all how do we define success yeah, i knew you were going to say something modest so uh no no let me let me tell you what i mean I don't, i'm not doing the whole false humility thing um i i re i'm genuinely interested in what what we mean when we talk about success in terms of things that are in the culture, you know, and the, there's the personal dimension, you know, I am excited to get up every morning and I am grateful to go to sleep at night and I feel good about what I've thought about it, what I've spent my, my day and my time and my neurons and my heart on in the day. So that to me is a pretty important and central part of the definition of success. The more out facing outer kind of, external aspect it gives me hope for for culture in general the fact that you know i run an ad free non-commercial donation supported website that at this point 
is really not only paying for itself, paying for my life, allowing me to start you know, scholarships at different universities and to donate to causes that I, are really important to me and to do things that are solely because individual strangers around the world see some value in this. Don't need a middleman. Don't need the, the, the people who are not treated as eyeballs, which is what the ad-supported model of journalism does. You, you, the reader, are just kind of a currency. Your currency that that the publication uses against the advertisers and vice versa. And to see that people are willing and and really, I don't know. I mean, I think there's something important happening when you can see that the so-called common reader to steal Virginia Woolf's term is engaged directly with stuff that matters to her to him without any kind of commercial you know voluntary donations are not transactional meaning they they it's not like they you give me your money and I give you my content which is a horrific term for any cultural material because they're voluntary, people get things that, I mean, my, my, what I do is free, has always been free, anybody can read it, it's free. But when people opt in to support it in a tangible way, they say this counts, this matters. And, you know, obviously public radio has been doing it for decades and, and public libraries do it. I donate to the public library every single month. And that gives me hope that, that we can transcend the, the cheap commercialism that is what's robbing culture of substance, that is what's reducing thought and art and cultural material to what's called content, which is essentially a term slapped onto things at the point of packaging. It is not a term that befits the mysterious and beautiful moment of creation at which a piece of art or writing is made and no artist or writer ever thinks of her his work as content you know yeah it's funny I, I now remember at the dawn of the internet age when people started using the term content those of us who had been in journalism before the internet all rolled our eyes we couldn't stand the idea that we were just creating a product but uh i, I guess I, I i now realize i've slowly resigned myself i've given i've surrendered i i you know i i use the term myself and uh and uh maybe i shouldn't uh be so obedient to uh mm -hmm. Susan Sontag, actually, she wrote in 1964 in Against Interpretation, she said, um, our task is not to find the maximum amount of content in a work of art. Our task is to cut back, to cut back the content so that we can see the thing at all. And I think the <clears throat> enormous, massive contentification that we see with journalism, with art, is completely preventing us from seeing the thing at all today. Okay, well, that's probably a, a good thought to close on. So, listen, thank you so much for taking the time out of your largely structured day. Uh, I know you'll 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 spend it. And thank you for doing what you do and for creating space for substantive and thoughtful conversation, which is quite rare today. We are we are trying. I, I need to, I need to become a little more successfully entrepreneurial in the way you you have, I think, and uh, and get let people donate. I I I am I'm, I'm hereby giving people permission to send me money. I guess I've never <laughs> been explicit enough about or cookies, that. Cookies, money or cookies. That I, I accept both. I, I accept all forms of yes, material, yeah. yes, whatever. Well, thanks so much. I encourage everybody to, to uh, look at the site, Brain Pickings. Um, subscribe to your Twitter feed, which is called, what's your actual Twitter handle? It's Brain Picker. Brain Picker, that, which would be you, I guess. Okay. Well, thanks so much. Thanks, Bob. Take care. Bye.